Hello, I'm Jay Jermaine Bay of Elodia Morris Pradium, Ante, Colorado. The acronym is ANPAC. I am the Chief Judge of Council of Court. Uh, today is Class 32, Class 32. Uh, what did we learn in Class 31? We started talking about the CAD. And who is the CAD? The CAD is the D Tax Assessor, or you could say Commissioner, depending on what boards want to do with their state rights, okay? So what function does the CAD have as it relates to government? Well, that's a good question because the CAD must be de jour. The CAD is a public official of your Moorish government. The CAD cannot be fictional. The CAD cannot be de facto. The CAD cannot be self-appointed. So as more start understanding how to use state rights to their advantage, more must quickly assess and continue to study international law. And in international law, you recognize that no one is self-appointed. So therefore, more want to start utilizing the title of CADI, C-A-D-I. Then how is the CADI appointed to the government? The CADI is appointed by is legislative group. The CAD is appointed by the executive branch. And then the CAD works side by side with the judicial branch. But those three branches of government can only be in existence if you have a de jure state provincial government. And if you're talking government, you're talking constitution. So therefore, that means you have a de jure constitution for your Moorish provincial state government within the Moroccan Empire. So everything we're talking about right now is talking about jurisdiction. So everything that MPAC study session classes are about, they're all about jurisdiction, all right? So even though our subject matter has recently been about the JAD, the JAD is just subject matter. But remember what I said, Moors. Subject matter is always number four on the list. So although we may be talking about the jab, really what we've been talking about in the last few classes is about jurisdiction. So what's the box number one? Jurisprudence. That's status. That's nationality. What's box number two? Jurisdiction. That is your latitude, longitude of your state. Once you understand the latitude, longitude of your state, now you're talking about the laws. The law is what? Proper venue when you have an application of difference with another state. And last but not least, now you talk about subject matter. That's the jab, speeding ticket, IRS, etc. So what are we really talking about? Jurisdiction. But your jurisdiction only comes through your state provincial government. So although we're talking about the jab, we're really talking about jurisdiction. If you're talking jurisdiction, you're talking state rights through your state. Your state has an application of difference with another state. Those two states now are trying to determine what application do you use. What do I mean when I say application? What law do you use? First things first, a state must have a constitution, so both states have an obligation to go back to their constitution, see what your constitution says. Once you look at your constitution, now you come back to the table and you say, okay, well, what's the application of difference that we use because we still have a dispute? Now you bring in the treaty. The treaty becomes the referee. The treaty in itself is an application, a friendly application of instructions on how two states that have a dispute deal with that dispute. So the treaty now takes on what's called the ultimate supreme jurisdiction. And those called compulsory jurisdiction. The treaty becomes a compulsory jurisdiction because both parties, whether it's a bilateral treaty or a multilateral treaty, the states that have a dispute have already agreed to compulsory jurisdiction of the treaty. And from the treaty, you utilize that common law, that jurisprudence, mother's law, nature's law, which creates the common law, the common sense of that treaty. And the treaty shall prevail 
if in fact specific language is in that treaty. All right? When two states have a dispute and they still cannot come to an agreement, a settlement, through that mediation of utilizing the treaty, council court gets involved and makes a decision. Council court's decision is still not acceptable to the disputing state, let's say it's the United States of America. Then the next level is understanding now you take it to the United Nations in order to maintain the peace. But Moors will never get to the United Nations unless they have a de jure state. Moors will never be able to utilize the judicial powers of council court unless they have a state. They'll never be able to utilize the power of the Kadi who now assesses warranty deeds if they don't have a state. And they'll never have a state if they don't have a Moorish constitution. So as MPAC continues to have these classes, keep in mind, uh, for those Moors out there who are trying to put together the principles of their constitution, feel free to reach out to MPAC. We'll do our best to try to give you some basic information on how to put together a constitution. Um, reach out to MPAC, so you'll reach out to info at MPAC.gov. Dot org, so that all the Moors will come together as an alliance. That way we can start moving forward what by us having our constitution in place. All right? So let's go ahead and get started. All right, as we usually open up, we must always maintain the mission and vision statement. All right? To create what? The United States of Morocco. So I quickly want to say um, thank you to the Moors out there that's been reaching out to MPAC. Who are now starting to put together their state provincial governments. We look forward to seeing the appellation of your state government up here on the map. MPAC looks forward to assisting all Moors and us coming together as an alliance, right? We're all in this together, so keep that in mind, Moors. There's not one state that has more priority over another state, so we're all in this together. So MPAC look, looks forward to being in a partnership, alliance with all the states as we fill out this map, okay, Moors? All right, so. With this map, as we start to fill it out, we're filling it out based upon what? Utilizing discipline. Discipline determines our destination. All right, and what is the destination? Let's be redundant. To create this desire, in order to achieve this desire, what do we have to do? We have to very least more. We have to create what's called a Circle seven, state of facts. The facts about your states, material facts that you can put on the record, all right? State of facts and judicial notice. The judicial notice through the council court is what you're going to give the foreigners to let them know on the record that you have formed your state provincial government. That becomes the material fact. It becomes political documents. Political documents. Because the truth is, you're already a moral. The truth is, as soon as you were born, you already came into governance. You're the oldest primogenitor on planet Earth. But now Earth is ran on what's called politics. So therefore, you must put what you call your abstract, your metaphysical science, also on paper through a political document. All right? Keep in mind, Morris. Our ancient mothers and fathers are the ones who started putting together what's called constitutions. The Moors out there are putting together a constitution. Don't think you're putting together, putting together a constitution because the colonists did it. No. Moors taught the colonists on how to put together constitutions because that's the birth of a nation. All right? So Noah Drali said he's going to leave the Europeans here long enough to teach us government again. Because Noah Drali knew that the colonists learned government from Moors. All right? Circle 7, state of facts. So what do we need at the very least, Moors? At the very least, we need what? Exhibit A, Moorish Constitution. Exhibit B, Moorish State Seal. Exhibit C, Moorish Provincial State Flag. Exhibit D, Moorish Empire of Morocco Flag, the Empire. Exhibit E, Allegiance and Oath to your Moroccan Provincial State Government. That's very important, Moors. The allegiance, that's the document, okay? That's your mortar that brings all these applications of difference together, all right? Last but not least, Exhibit F, public inauguration video. Circle 7, state of facts, okay? All right. 
So as MPAC study session classes, so far, we've gone to step number three. So, so far through Council of Court of the State, we've been dealing with an application of difference. We've been talking about the jab, but now we've turned the conversation based upon counterintelligence, political counterintelligence. Now we've turned it into talking about jurisdiction, and now we're examining their deeds. What are we doing? The United States of America and the United States have been on the offense. They've been utilizing what's called use of force. They're utilizing what's called compulsory jurisdiction. They're utilizing what's called extraterritorial jurisdiction. They're utilizing what's called use of force. They're maintaining what's called coercion. They're maintaining what's called corruption. They're maintaining what you call crimes against humanity. The only defense you have against that is your state rights, period. That's it. There are no shortcuts, Morris. All you have is your state provincial government constitution and state rights as a defense to deal with their mayhem. Morris should look up the word mayhem to get an understanding of what that truly means, mayhem, all right? So far, we're at number three, Morris. So Council Court of the State, Council Court has issued these documents, okay? First, we start off with what? State of facts, judicial notice, let's be redundant, which is mediation. We're maintaining equality because we're now seeking diplomacy. We sent, them their we sent the Circle 7 exhibits, which is the discovery document, or what you call friendly applications. So we're utilizing the verbiage of the treaties, Treaty of Peace and Friendship, Article 24. Number two, now we send the injunctive relief order when we recognize they're disobeying the judicial notice. Now we're looking at now arbitration before litigation because now we're starting to escalate it. We're giving a little bit more demands now, okay? Then we get into number three, contempt of court order. Now we're going right into fines, penalties, confiscation, etc. because now we sent a lawsuit, which is litigation. Contempt of court, okay? So now we're looking at, now we're studying now section four, number four, step four. We're looking at now surety bond lien on property, which is the penalties. We learned about what? Act Algeceras of 1906, Article 102 talks about fines, penalties, and confiscation. So that's what we're studying now. Now we're learning about the CAD, the CAD, which is the D Tax Commissioner or Assessor, whatever the Moors choose to title their CAD. So we're pretty soon we start talking about the notice of lien of surety bond and the lien levied against the warranty D. That's what we're talking about. The stage we're at right now, Moors. Keep in mind, like I said, in the future we're talking about step number five, which is Erba Amis principles of international law meaning towards all or towards everyone, which is the state rights of the Moors, it's international law, which is the trespass in law because the foreigners are trespassing in Morocco if, in fact, they're breaching the treaties, if, in fact, they're breaching constitution principles, if, in fact, they're breaching declarations, if, in fact, they're breaching the charter of the United Nations, etc., etc., all right? So that means they're trespassing because now they're outlaws because they're working outside of the law. But guess who else has been working outside of the law? Moors. If so, ju if so jure, Moors subjects have also been working outside of the law because Moors have not been following the instructions of the international law. Moors must be de jure and put together their state government. Why? Because treaty is supreme law of the land. The Treaty of Madrid of 1880, Article 15 says, Moors must come back and pledge allegiance. They must consent to a Moroccan government. Have Moors done that? No. So Moors cannot be self-appointed. If you're self-appointed, Moors, that means that you're working outside of the law. What am I re really saying? Your abstract, your moral Status is 100% correct, Morris. You have every right to enforce your inalienable rights morally. But the world now is ran on state rights. 
And through state rights, you'll be de jure. If you're not operating through a state that makes you de jure, excuse me, de facto, no different than the colonists. So Moors have to correct our status. Okay? We have to be de jure. All right? So when we de jure, now we're dealing with mediation, then litigation, then we get into fines, penalties, and confiscations. Okay? So as we continue to go through this, we get into ergonomics later down the road. Let's just build up our fundamentals as we get closer towards step number five. So let's get back to step number four, okay? That's where we are right now. We've been talking about what? The KID. Okay? So let's get some basic fundamental principles out the way. Let's get an understanding. We must always understand our concepts based upon the context. Okay? What's happening? What are we talking about? The state, the E state of the Moors. Right now, we're making a challenge to the colonists based upon the E state. When we create the Constitution, immediately we're challenging the jurisdiction. <clears throat> when Tashmi Bay talks about the quo warranto, quo warranto, quo means question. Warranto means the warrant, the warranty, the authority is being questioned. So when Moors are talking about the quo warranto, you're questioning the colonists' jurisdiction of their authority. But guess what, Moors? The colonists get to turn around and ask us the same question. What's your delegation authority orders? Where is your state provincial government according to international law? If you're self-appointed, you yourself are de facto. So that's what we got to understand is Moors. I don't say that as a negative. I congratulate everything the Moors has been doing because it's been an exercise. But we all must start listening to Tashri Bay. He's been giving us the answers to the test. He said we must have a political allegiance. What is he trying to tell us? That we need a de jure state provincial government. All right? So what I was saying up here is this. She who controls the land controls its laws and its wealth. She who controls the land controls its laws and its wealth. What does that mean? Moors are concerned with the jab as a subject matter. But the jab falls under an application of difference. Moors should check the first three boxes before they get to the fourth, which is subject matter. If you check the first three boxes, now you're talking about jurisprudence, right? Jurisdiction. Then you're talking about proper venue. Okay? So what's happened here? She who controls the land. What's the land? The E state. If you control the land, now you control the laws. What are the laws? The Constitution and the treaties, because you made a proper claim to the E state, the land, the soil, based upon your latitude, longitude of your Constitution. And if you control the law, that means you control whether you get the jab or not. Much less the wealth. Wealth always comes last. First, Moors have to now be in discipline and understand. You want control over your destiny, your intentional future? Then she who controls the land. How do you control the land? Your constitution. Jurisdiction. Then you control its laws. What laws? The laws of your Moor state. Your jurisdiction, your bylaw, then you get into the wealth. Okay? So, more of a concern about the jab, don't worry about the jab. Worry about the law. What law are you using? What principles are you using to say objection or rejection to the jab? Article 24, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, talks about a rejection. How do you reject the inject shun? Well, here's the answer. Laws. Laws of what? The land. Well, whose land? Her land. Who's the her? The matriarchs. Nature's law, mother's law, common law, jurisprudence. So Morris want to stop subject matter? Put together your law. You need a constitution. All right? Now, today, 
as we continue moving forward, we'll keep talking about the Kadi. The Kadi in the Black Law Dictionary, fourth edition, is a magistrate. Okay? But how did the Kadi come to be? Good question. Government. Three branches of government. The Kadi is only acting as a public authority, a public officer on behalf of who? The queen, the matriarch. She. She who controls the land. She. Who is the she? The matriarch. Who is the matriarch? The constitution. The constitution, constellation, cosmology, cosmopolitan, she, astrology, estar, estar. She is step number one, the law. Who is number two? Now she, through her government, her laws, set forth the judicial branch, the Kazi, Council of Court. Council of Court deals with fines, penalties, confiscations, enforcing justice. But who else gets involved? The Kadi, who works in the executive branch. So you got the executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch. The Kadi, which is number three, works in the executive branch, who's in charge of taxes and revenue of the treasury. But the Kadi is only acting on behalf of the queen, the matriarch, and who is the matriarch based upon the political status? The Constitution. So she, who's the she? Constitution. Who's the she for political status? Constitution. Who is she based upon the physical status? The matriarch, the queen. The queen sets forth the Kazi judicial branch, and she sets forth the Kadi, which is all government that controls the laws. Now listen more. What are we talking about right now? We're talking about intelligence. Counterintelligence of using politics. When I ask a person, do you have a high IQ? Most people say, yeah, because we're all biased. And then I turn around and say, the acronym IQ, what does it stand for? Most people get quiet. Uh, I don't know. It stands for intelligence quotient. We all think we have a high IQ, but the reality is all we do is pronounce words. So we don't look up words. We just say them. We repeat them. Because we think it has meaning, but you never took the time to look up the meaning. IQ means intelligence quotient. In tell quotient. Intel quotient. What's the quotient? Quo. What's quo? Quo. Q. Quo, question. Intelligent to be able to answer questions. Question are all about mathematics. Intelligence, quotient, quotient, quo, shit. What's the shit? Potion. Potion. What's a potion? Mathematical equations of the almanac. We must all understand we're dealing with alchemist, alchemist. Everything we're talking about is mathematical equations. That's all chess is. Math. Strategic math. Narrowing things down to a result. A consistent result. So what are we talking about? The queen. Listen more. Qua, quo, que, que, que in Spanish. How do you say what in Spanish? K. Q U E. K. What? What? K. What? What is your authority? 
Only the mothers can ask that question. Quote, quote, IQ, intelligent quotient, Q, quote, quotient, Q, quote, quote, queen, queen. Queens establish the mathematical equation of law. The quote, quote, queen, queen is the first step in a mathematical equation. X times Y equals Z. It's just a generic mathematical equation. X times Y equals Z. So you must understand the queen asks the question because she is the authority. The queen asks the question of all others. She puts together the quotient, which is the potion, which is the formula on how to do everything she needs on behalf of her law and her wealth. Because she, who controls the land, controls its laws and its wealth. So she is the constitution, constellation. What is constellation? It's the mathematical equation of the almanac. It's all math. Math. Mom. M-A. Mom. It's mom. So you got to understand, we taught the colonists all these things. Now we must turn around and utilize these same skill sets ourselves. We must utilize our intellect, our high IQ, which is, quote, intelligence, quote, shen, quote, meaning question. We must question things because we're using our intellect to get answers. We question anyone who's attacking our intelligence. Anyone who's now infringing on our intelligence of our rights, of our jurisdiction, our law. Law who? Mother. So the queen, step one, constitution. Through the constitution, you put together the judicial branch. Now the Kazi, the judicial branch, council court, protects mother's law. Now mother brings in the Kadi based upon her estate to now look at the deeds of the colonists, i.e. the foreigners. So mother's using her law of her land, of the constitution, the estate, utilizing the authority of her government. That's all we're talking about right now. Nature's law, mother's law, common law, jurisprudence that now puts together the justice. Okay, Morris? All right. So, all right, let's continue. So the Kadi, as we know, is a magistrate, right? So the magistrate, as we've already learned, let's go down to this last paragraph here. The magistrate, the word magistrate, does not necessarily imply an officer exercising any judicial functions, meaning not a judge. However, it might very well be held to embrace notaries and commissioners of deeds. Remember now, the colonists are pointing this out. Every time you read the Black Law Dictionary, you must always understand the colonists are always using what you call confessions. They're confessing their crimes. They're always confessing. They think that's going to help them with their karmatic debt. It is not. Everything must come to the around in a circle and be judged with justice. And justice will prevail. So the Kadi is the magistrate who deals with, let's now convert it to a more thought process, who deals with the commissions of deeds. But the Kadi can also be what? A notary. I want to make sense of this. This is very important why I'm pointing this out. It's all going to make sense, okay? Now remember what I said about the Kadi. From a political perspective, the Kazi, which is your judge of council court, and the Kadi, who oversees the deed tax assessor, assessing the deeds of the foreigners, is like two rooks on a chessboard. 
controlling the same row, controlling the rank and file of this political counterintelligence game, all right, of what they call statehood. Keep in mind, like I said, Boris, the East East uses the state as a pass-through, as a pass-through to interface with other states, okay? The E-State is what you call organic. This is the human being. Over here, this is your construct you're putting together to interface with other constructs. It's like anybody out there who owns a corporation. You're a plumber, you open a plumbing company. The plumber is the living being, but the plumbing company is how he interfaces with his clients or interfaces with other states, etc., through the rules and regulations that governs plumbers. Everything is about a pass through, it's politics. Okay, Morris must understand that. The E state is always ours, but we must learn politics to work through the state, all right? So the Kazi and the Kadi work side by side as a powerful combination on behalf of the queen, i.e. the matriarch, on behalf of the law of the land of the Constitution. The Kazi and the Kadi create serendipitous discovered checks when strategically used in combination of each other, the Kazi's contempt sanctions will cause the Kadi to satisfy the validity of the title, i.e. the deed, in conformity to the Mohammedan law. It's what you call political counterintelligence. We'll keep talking about this. We'll be redundant with this as more as really understand what the Kadi and the Kazi, how you use them in combination of each other like rooks on a chessboard because they're working on behalf of mother's law. Nature's law, the Constitution. All right? All right. So the Kadi is responsible for what? Let's be redundant for it. This is chapter four. If I can have a mother read the title of chapter four three times. All right. Chapter four A Declaration Concerning a Better Return of Taxes and the Creation of New Revenues. A declaration concerning a better return of taxes and the creation of new revenues. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. A declaration concerning a better return of taxes and the creation of new revenues. All right. Thank you, Mom. Why are we reading that three times? What, what treaty is that or what declaration? Oh, Act of Algeceras, 1906. Thank you, Mother, for the question. For the record, more than home. This is the Act of Algeceras. You're 1906, chapter 4. All right? Thank you, Mom. Mm -hmm. All right. Why don't we read this three times? Morris must always remember the treaties are always about commerce. We'll learn here in just a moment about commerce, just a little bit more about how the colonists see their status in Morocco. All right? But let's be redundant. Let's go back and read Article 60. To understand what is the regulation and usage, what does that mean? The law. The law of the constitution of the land, right? So the law of the land on behalf of the constitution is now putting the Kadi to enforce deeds, right? Article 60, Mother, if you can read that. Article 60. In accordance with the right granted by Article 11 of the Madrid Convention, foreigners shall have the right to acquire property throughout the Sharifian Empire, and His Majesty the Sultan shall issue to his administrative and judicial officers such instructions as may be necessary for them not to refuse the registration of deeds without lawful cause. Subsequent transfers, either by deeds between living parties or by death, shall continue without hindrance. In the ports open to commerce and within a radius of 10 kilometers around such ports, His Majesty the Sultan, generally and without it being necessary to henceforth, being necessary henceforth for foreign subjects to obtain a special permission for each purchase of property, 
now grants the consent required by Article 11 of the Madrid Convention. At Qasar El Kabir, Arlila, Azamur, and eventually in other towns of the coast or the interior, the general authorization stated above is likewise granted to foreigners, but only for purchasers within a radius of two kilometers around those towns. Wherever foreigners may have acquired property, they will be permitted to erect buildings in compliance with re regulations and usage. Before authorizing the execution of deeds for transferring property, the Qadi will have to satisfy himself of the validity of the title in conformity to the Mohammedan law. The Maxin shall designate in each city and district specified in this article the Qadi who shall have charge of such verification. All right, thank you, Mohammed. All right, so the Qadi is responsible for validating deeds, right? Here we go, a little more specific. Before authorizing the execution of deeds for transferring property, the Qadi will have to satisfy himself of the validity of the title, title meaning deed, in conformity to the Mohammedan law. So wait, before authorizing the execution of deeds for transferring property, who is this speaking to? It's speaking directly to the foreigners. Giving specific instructions to the foreigners that before they transfer that deed, the Kaibi will have to satisfy himself with the validity of the title and conforming to the Mohammedan law. All right? So that's very important for Morris to understand as we keep talking about the Kaibi. Okay, boys. Let's do a little bit of refresher, shall we? This is George Washington's letter to C. Muhammad, December 1st, 1789. Why are we reading this? We must always remember that the Sultan of Morocco allowed the colonists to stay only for them to pay in order to stay. We'll confirm this just through George Washington. He says it himself. Okay? Let's go down to more germane information. Hey, Mother, we can start here, please. We greatly regret that the hostile disposition of those regencies towards the United States who have never injured them is not to be removed on terms in our power to comply with. Within our territory, there are no mines, either of gold or silver, and this young nation, just recovering from the waste and desolation of a long war, have not as yet had time to acquire riches by agriculture and commerce. But our soil is bountiful, and our people industrious, and we have reason to flatter ourselves that we shall gradually become useful to our friends. The encouragement which your majesty has been pleased generously to give to our commerce with your dominions, the punctuality with which you have caused the treaty with us to be observed, and the just and generous measures taken in the case of Captain Proctor made a deep impression on the United States and confirmed their respect for and attachment to your Imperial Majesty. Thank you, Mother. All right. Listen to what George Washington is saying. George Washington and the 13 colonies, i.e. the colonists, are refugees in Morocco. They are expatriates of Great Britain. They wanted permission to stay in Morocco. Sidi Muhammad allowed them to stay in Morocco. Why? He was only interested in commerce. But he told the colonists, if you want to stay, you have to pay for my protection. Let's prove it. Yeah, George Washington himself talks about this. All right, so we greatly regret the hostile disposition 
of those regencies towards the United States who have never injured them, who is it them? The Moors. They're saying they never injured the Moors. Is not to be removed. Not to remove who? Moors. Because Moors are the sovereigns of the land. They had government in place. On terms and our power to comply with. What is he talking about? Power to comply with what? He's talking about the treaty. Remember, the treaty came out in 1786, fully ratified in 1787 by the Continental Congress. Okay? So he's talking about still complying with the treaty. Okay? But he's also talking about complying to their constitution of the colonists, because Sidi Muhammad and the Moors taught them how to put together the constitution. Without, within our territories, there are no mines, either of gold or silver, and this young nation just recovering from the waste. Let's stop right there. Why is George Washington pointing out silver and gold? He owed taxes because Sidi Muhammad wanted his revenue. George Washington's pointing out that they're behind in paying the rent. And you can't stay if you don't pay. Let's continue. And dissolution, a desolation, excuse me, of a long war have not it yet had time to acquire riches by what? Agricultural. What are you talking about? They hadn't had time to get, put together an infrastructure for farming. for farming, trade, or anything in order to create what? Commerce for themselves. But once they create commerce for themselves, now they got to pay the rent. They got to pay the revenue in order to stay in Morocco. But watch. He, he's asking for more time. Listen. But our soil is bountiful and our people industrious. And we have reason to flatter ourselves that we shall gradually become useful to our friends. What does that mean? They're going to pay the rent. See, Muhammad only cared about commerce. That's what treaties are about. Amity and commerce. George Washington recognized not only was the Continental Congress laid on pain, listen, but George Washington had just formed a brand new constitution called the United States of America Republic. And that new constitution was obligated to pay taxes in order to stay. So George Washington's telling Sidi Muhammad, look, I know we're late already, and now I'm coming to you petitioning you to even establish a brand new constitution, but yet we're late on the rent. But I promise you, I will comply and become useful to you, because I know you only care about commerce. So please allow us to now establish the United States of America so that we can now Pay to stay. That must be understood, Moors. Stay where? The encouragement which your majesty has been pleased generously to give to our commerce with your dominions. You're in Morocco. This is George Washington admitting it on the record. The punctuality which, with which you have caused the treaty with us to be observed. Who caused the treaty? See, Muhammad, what did he do? He reigned in the order. Y'all will sign this treaty. Because if you don't sign this treaty, then you can't stay. And by signing this treaty, you have to pay. That's the obligation to comply with. Punctuality, we start here. Punctuality with which you have called the treaty with us to be observed. And the just and generous measures taken in the case of Captain Proctor made a deep impression on the United States and confirmed their respect for an attachment to your imperial majesty. So right here, George Washington admitting that it's an empire, imperial, empire. And he's attached to it. What is that called? That's a lease agreement. There's an attachment, cohabitating lease agreement involved called trades, a trade agreement. 
is what you call a warranty agreement. The treaty is a warranty. Gives assurance for who? For the tenant to stay. And it gives an insurance for who? The landlord to collect the rent. It's nothing but a lease agreement. That's all the treaty is because it's about commerce. And the lease agreement has bylaws in it. Here's what the landlord has to do. Here's what the tenant has to do. Both sides have the warranty agreement of assuring both sides are going to maintain equality so both sides will be at peace. Because first you must reign in the order. That's the contract. Once you reign in the order, the order is the contract, the proper written instrument, the negotiable instrument, the application. Then you can start talking about peace because the contract talks about the peace or how you deal with a dispute. Then you get into what? Prosperity. George Washington understood this. The attachment is both the, their constitution and the treaty. Listen more. Why does Tosh V. Bay keep saying enforce the Constitution? Because he knows that once we study their obligations that they have to comply to because they're an attachment to our land, when he says enforce the Constitution, Noah Drali said enforce the Constitution, what are they talking about? They have to teach the Moors the fundamentals of understanding what were the colonists' obligations to Moors. A. So when we studied their constitution, what did we learn? The constitution kept talking about treaties. Treaty, treaty, treaties. Keeps talking about treaties. Uh, the supreme law of the land. Follow the yellow brick road. Okay, you study the constitution for the United States of America, it talks about treaties. Article 3, Article 6. Treaties. Okay, follow the yellow brick road. Now you go back and study the treaty. The treaty says what? A more. Now you recognize your nationality, it's more. Okay, keep going back, because you're going backwards to what? Your ancient mother and fathers, you're going backwards. Now you find out you're more. Okay, now you gotta study the law and history of what does more mean? Then come to find out, by studying the word more, you start understanding what? Government, that we had governments. That we built all these limestone buildings, all these megalithic stone all these energy centers all around the world because we had government, we had equality because we were maintaining the Mohammedan law, the Muslim law, mother's law, common law, nature's law. We start now, keep going backwards, we start recognizing there was a government in place. So when Tashmi Bey says enforce the constitution, he's telling you to follow the yellow brick road, understanding the obligations of their constitution, but then take it a step further and understand the obligations of the treaty that Moors must also be de jure. Now in the 20th and 21st century, they created what's called the League of Nations and then the United Nations, which is an international organization that governs the sovereignty of the people who have states. So not only do Moors have to now understand the constitution and the obligations of the colonists, we must also understand our obligations to ourselves. Keep in mind, the word more comes with a lot of obligations. More is just not a word you get to throw around, I'm a more. What does it mean? It means you're obligated to understand your ancient mother and father's principles of government. Tashri Bey wants to keep going backwards and pull the ancient mother and father's principles forward. That's why he says study law and history and then bring it forward. Don't stay back here just studying. Bring it forward. Bring those principles forward. Yes, we got the abstract. But now it's time for more to now bring that abstract forward in real time and enforce Moorish constitutions enforce the treaties and utilize international law to our advantage because international law is part and parcel to our treaties now. That must be understood. George Washington understood this because at the time, Sidi Mohammed was the United Nations. Sidi Mohammed controlled all trade. Sidi Mohammed 
is personally responsible for bringing in France and Spain to help the United States. But at the time, they were the Continental Congress. So he was bringing in the other nations to help the Continental Congress to deal with Great Britain. That's the nations coming together to deal with one belligerent rogue state called Great Britain. Let's continue. Why are we reading this? To remind you that George Washington recognized the treaties are all about commerce. But before you get to the commerce, first you must reign in the order. What's that? Law. The law creates the peace. Then the peace now brings in prosperity. Okay? Let's continue. Go ahead, Mother. I have a quick question. So within the treaties and the constitutions, um, there was two constitutions, correct? The Constitution of the United States of America. Yes. And then the Constitution of just the United States. Yes, but they have never had an assembly to officially put it on the record, so they snuck it in through their Senate and their House of Representatives on what they call the Act of Congress, 1871. Now, from the first one, the, the United States of America spoken of the treaty. Did their new constitution speak of the treaties? Like, were they trying to hide the treaties? Is no. That, okay. So the only way that C. Muhammad accepted George Washington's... Okay, let's go to, let's go to the top. Well, no. Just a moment, let me ask you a question with, with, uh, with reference points. Right here. Okay. Since the date of the letter which the late Congress, by their president, addressed to your imperial majesty, the United States of America have thought proper to change their government and to institute a new one agreeable to the Constitution, new Constitution, see? And which I have had the honor of herewith enclosing a copy. A new Constitution, which is their second one in less than three years. Now, is that the one we as the people still? It's still we the people of the Republic. All right. Okay, let's continue. Okay. Okay, boys. Let's get into some more substance, okay? We start off talking about the jab. Through counterintelligence, now we switch it on them. Now we're talking about their deed. Why? Because of the contempt of court order has now through cost of court, has now brought in the Kaidi, because the Kaidi is now giving an order for now the Kaidi to go put a lien on their deed. But like I told the Moors, their deeds are now titled as warranty deed. They add the word warranty to the word deed. Okay, so the Kaidi is now putting a lien on their warranty deed. Okay, so let's, let's make this a little bigger for our more than home. This is an actual warranty deed. This is a real warranty deed. I just want the more than home to see it. Warranty deed, we'll be talking about that, okay? Why are we talking about this? Moors have to build up the fundamentals of understanding how do you utilize the Kadi. We just can't rush in real quick, Moors. We got to learn fundamentals on how we utilize government, the power of the government. Okay, the power of the pen. Whose pen? Mother's pen. So mother's pen must be about equality. So we're learning equality of how we utilize the government in a fair and just way. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Okay, so we're building up fundamentals. So the warranty deed is what all the colonists have to lay claims to what they call property. Okay. This is a real warranty deed. I just want to give you guys a snapshot of it. We won't go through the warranty deed today. I just want to let you guys see it because we're going to go through it in the future. Okay, that's a warranty deed. Okay, this is what it looks like when you look at their so-called public records of their states. Okay? Now, when you're looking at the warranty deed, Tosh Bay taught us Go pull what's called a chain of title. 
Why was he teaching us that? He said, go pull the chain of title. What is that? That's all the warranty deeds that the colonists had. So this is a warranty deed, right? Of Catherine L. Santoro, right? Who transferred the warranty deed of this property to Jason Men. But Todd said, go pull the warranty deed chain of title. And what you do is, you'll find out there's been several warranty deeds on the same property. Okay? So now we're on page two right now. There's 15 pages. I'm not going to go through all the warranty deeds because we're going to get back to this. But I just want more to see when Tashi Bay said, well, pull the chain of title. What was he talking about? You're looking at all the deeds now that have been transferred to another form. Now you're looking for the KD to see if the KD validated that warranty deed. Watch this. So this was the first warranty deed, right? We're looking at that. Now you look at the bottom of every warranty deed, and who's at the bottom? Purpose of example. This is Cindy Bittner. She was the notary public state of Colorado corporation. She was a notary. She had, she says right here, my commission expires on this particular date. Why am I pointing this out? This is the seal that she used as her delegation of authority orders to say the warranty deed had been authorized. See right here? Witness my hand an official seal, notary public. So she's acting on behalf of the state of, let's use Arizona or Colorado here as an example. Where do we see that at? Magistrate. Definition of magistrate. The word magistrate does not necessarily imply an officer exercising any judicial functions and might very well be held to embrace notaries and commissions, commissioners of deeds. So she's the magistrate who? She's acting as the magistrate. She, Cindy Bittner, is acting as the notary of the public, even though she's not public, she's private, state of Colorado, the notary and the commission expires. So she's the commissioner, the magistrate, giving the seal of the state, saying that the witness my hand an official seal, because she's working through the state, the living being is working through the state of the seal of the state. Okay, well, wait a minute. Here's the document. Where's the Kadi? Nowhere to be found. Where is the Kadi's seal of the state? It's because the Kadi didn't exist. Because the Moors didn't have a state to have a state seal to put on the warranty deed. So the colonists, through their education board, have dummied the Moors down to not understand who we are as a nationality. Because we understood nationality, eventually we started understanding government in order to protect the nationality. And eventually, through that government, we will have a Kadi to now put the seal on their warranty deed. Go ahead, Mother. So, would the notary be like the imposter of the Kadi, uh, meaning that the Kadi was the original 
Um, and then the, I mean, just from the terminology of the words and the definitions, we have a notary. So they replaced it with a notary instead of the official original hadith. Okay, good question. Remember, the bilateral treaty of peace and friendship is a cohabitating contract. So you need two signatures to have a contract. So therefore, this notary, that seal would be a good seal in good faith along with the Qadi if the Qadi has stamped it as well. Because they're both working through the state, signing it on behalf of the state. So now both parties are de jure and enforcing the law and maintaining that application of equality. So both stamps should be on it. Both seals should be on this one document, warranty deed. Okay, so just for clarification, uh -huh. I thought that the Qadi was the magistrate, which is also the notary. Yes, so for, for yeah. our state. For our state. They would notarize with the seal from your provincial state government. They would put the seal on it. Gotcha. Approving so we validated. still need both seals. You need, still need both For seals. Both parties. Both parties, but that makes a contract. Gotcha. Okay. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. So, based upon this example, no Kadi. What does that mean? Now they're breaching the contract. What contract? The Act of Albuceras, 1906, Article 60, that the Kadi shall satisfy himself of the validity or conformity of the title based upon Mohammedan law. What's Mohammedan law? The state, the government. If there's no Kadi sealed on any of the warranty deeds, they immediately become null and void. We'll keep talking about this. We won't read the warranty deed right now, right? It has verbiage. As you can see, it has verbiage. We won't read it right now. We're going to come back and read it later on. Why? First, got to look at some definition of words. That way, when we go back and read the warranty deed, we understand the warranty deed. We don't want to just read and just be pronouncing words don't know what they mean. Okay? All right. Let's continue. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about the warranty deed. What's the definition of warranty? We all have a generic understanding of it. But how does it matter in law? Okay? So let's have the mothers read the definition of warranty. Warranty. A promise that a proposition of fact is true. Okay. Thank you, mother. That's a short sentence, isn't it? A warranty. Short and straight to the point. What are they saying? Listen, Morris. A promise that a proposition of fact is true. That the fact, what fact? The material fact. What's the material fact? The application. What's the application? The warranty itself. Let's say you go to Sears, right? Sears department store, you buy a refrigerator. They say, we're going to give you a one-year warranty. The warranty becomes the application. It becomes the warranty. The warranty is the assurance, insurance that says there's a contract involved. And if something happens to that refrigerator, you can bring it back based upon the warranty. So the material fact, warranty, a promise that a proposition of fact is true. So it's true that you have the fact of the warranty. It's a fact. But why do they say a fact is true? Fact and true. Remember what I told you, two separate words. The difference between fact and true. Fiction, non-fiction. You ask a child, is Santa Claus real? He say yes, that's a fact. And he'll say it's true because he saw him at the mall. You ask the adult the same question. Is Santa Claus real? They say, yeah, it's a fact. But it's not true. That's the level of degrees Moors have to get to in understanding law. 
So therefore, there's a warranty. What's the warranty? We're talking real estate right now. We're talking deeds. Keep that in mind. They have a deed. That's a material fact. It's a piece of paper, application, proper written instrument. That's a fact. But is it true? It depends on who you ask. You ask the columnist, is their deed a fact? And is it true? They'll say yes. If you ask them more, they'll say, do they have a deed? You say, yes. Material fact, they have it. Proper written instrument. But is it true? That depends on your level of degrees and knowledge of understanding law. So when you study, you'll find out through international law that a Kadi had to sign off on the deed. Because if Kadi didn't sign it, then that means their deed isn't true. But if you don't know about the Kadi, then you think a deed is a fact and true. That's based upon your level of degrees of you increasing your knowledge. That's what impact study sessions are all about, increasing the level of degrees of the Moors through what? Qualification reference points of international law, studying law dictionary, etc. Okay? Let's go through this again. It's important to understand. Warranty is a promise. What's the promise? Treaties, constitutions, declarations, promises. A proposition of fact is true. We'll keep reading. Real property law, mother. A real covenant by the grantor of lands for himself and his heirs to warrant and defend the title and possession of the estate granted to the grantee and his heirs, whereby either upon, upon voucher or judgment in the writ of warrantia charse and the eviction of the grantee by paramount title, the grantor was bound to recompense him with other lands of equal value. Okay, let's continue. Sale of personal property. Sales of personal property. A statement or representation made by the seller of goods contemporaneously with and as a part of the contract of sale, though collateral to the express object of it, having reference to the character, quality, or title of the goods by which he promises or undertakes that certain facts or or shall or shall be certain facts are or shall be as he then represents them. Okay, start right there, Mom. Let's read this again. S sales of personal property. A statement or representation made by seller of goods contemporaneously with and as a part of the contract of sale. So keep in mind, we're talking about their deeds, their houses. A sale took place. Through collateral to the express object of it, having reference to the character, quality, or title of the goods by which he promises or undertakes that the certain facts are, are or shall be as he then represents them. What does this mean? There's a very important word here Moore's need to understand. What is contemporaneously? Well, we're talking warranty. Warranty deeds. It's a very powerful word to them. Warranty deed is what their holy grail is or what they're holding on as it relates to their property. What's this word contemporaneously? Let's look it up. Contemporaneous. Mother, could you read this for me, please? Contemporaneous. Adjective. Existing or occurring or occurring in the same period of time. Okay. Thank you, Mother. Contemporaneous. Adjective. Existing or occurring in the same period of time. That's a short sentence for such a big word. Why is that? They're trying to tell you something more. We have to use forensics. We, can't, we have to stop pronouncing words and get into the IQ, intelligence quotient, and question, question, 
question, quote, question, what's happening? Existing occurring in the same period of time. Someone gives you a warranty, that warranty is good right there in that period of time. It's warranted. It's a fact. But what makes it true? You don't find out if it's true until a period of time goes back and you got to go back, back now and utilize that warranty. That's when you find out if it's true. Listen to me. So they're saying right here, existing or occurring in the same period of time. What period of time? Right there in that moment. They issue you a warranty. They say, it's good. We're talking warranty deeds. Oh, let's talk Sears. Sears department store. You buy a refrigerator. They give you the warranty. It's good for a year. But wait. It's a fact. But is it true? Wait a minute. You buy a refrigerator at Sears right now. Isn't Sears going through a bankruptcy? They already closed thousands of stores. But you walk in there, man, that's a good sale on that refrigerator. And I got a one-year warranty, man. It's fact. Is it true? You don't find out things are true until you need to go back and use the warranty. But if Sears closes, is the warranty still good? We'll learn about that. So Most lies people, and the fraud, though. I'm sorry. It's like lies and fraud. I mean, because just like it just says, the period of time. So at the time of the transaction, yeah, it's good. The warranty is good. But after you walk out that door, the warranty is no longer good. Just like buying a vehicle. Yes. You get that extra warranty. Yes. You don't know if something's true until you come back and try to use the warranty. That's when you find out the validity of whether it's true or not. Yeah, we're going deep here, Morris. Be patient with me. I'll get us through this. This is all important, Morris, to understand the fundamentals of how the colonists talk and how Morris must use their IQ, intelligence quotients, to question the validity of things especially as it relates to warranty deeds. But wait a minute, I thought we were talking about the jazz. We are talking about the jazz, but the jazz is subject matter. We've used intelligence quotients, IQ, to reverse it on them, talking about their deeds. You start talking about their deeds, they don't want to talk about the jab no more. Why? Listen. Taj Shree Bay said the only way the Moor is going to get out of this is with pain. Pain is a great teacher. But guess who else is going to have some pain? The colonists. When Moors have de jure governments, because now we utilize the Constitution sheet to do what? Control the land and its laws. That's going to create wealth, prosperity for us. That's going to create pain for the colonists. Why? Because they don't want to give up their false representation of being the wizard of all. So as I walk you through this slowly, Morris, we're talking government, we're talking jurisdiction, we're talking about quo warranto, question the warranty of what? Their government and their warranty deeds. Listen to me, Morris. That's what we're doing right now, real slow. We're not going to go through this fast more. We've got to learn government. Contemporaneous. Listen, Morris. I'm going to give every more, especially more than home. Don't blurt it out. I'm going to give every more 30 seconds to point out four words in this long word. 30 seconds. Don't blurt it out. I'm going to count it down in my head. Go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Put your pencils down. four words in here. Moors must look at words like a crossword puzzle. What are the four words? It's 
Four words disguised in the word contemporaneous. First word is con. Con means has a duality meaning. It means two. Like a contract, conduit, a concept, um, contractors. Con artists. And it could mean con artists. So the word con has a duality meaning. Con can mean deceptive. But con also means two things contacting, contacting, two things contacting. Two things come into connection. So it has a duality meaning. It can be positive, it can be negative. So the first word is con. What's the second word? Contemporary. You see it? Temporary. Crossword puzzle. This is how Morris must read. Because the con is buried words. They say things to you, not realizing you agree to the spell, negative spell through their spelling. So contemporary means what? New or modern. It's new, false statutes. Through their statutes, they create the warranty deed. But contemporary, right? Contemporary. Contemporary means new. They create something new. They ain't going by the old law. They going by the New statutes. Listen to me, Morris. What's number three? Temporary. They're saying the warranty is temporary. Why is it temporary? Because it has a term. What's the term? Well, the first term is 50 years max, Treaty of Peace and Friendship, Article 25. They know their warranty deeds renew every 50 years. If the, if the treaty is not renewed, the deeds immediately terminate. So all of their warranty deeds are what? T temporary. Because you're dealing with time, tempo, tempo, time, tempo, temporary. It's temporary. It's not permanent. Because they're foreigners in our land. They only get to stay if they pay and abide by the law of the land, which is mother's law. What's the third word? I mean, fourth word. Erroneous. You see it? Erroneous. Erroneous. You see it? What does erroneous mean? Wrong or incorrect. False promise. False contract. See, the foreigners knowingly and willingly commit fraud, or they knowingly and willingly commit false representation. Moors have to start reading like this. Why am I taking my time? Because Moors have to understand, when you start to understand the power of the state, and the power of the Kadi and the Kazi, this is nothing to be played with. So we must understand the basic fundamentals of this or how powerful this is. This is not to be played with. It's like a gun that's loaded. And right now, Moors are in an infant novice status right now of understanding government. And we'll pick this up and do some harm with it that we didn't intend to do. So we must learn how to read and understand Yes, the colonists are in dis dishonor. They confess it, and you don't even realize it just by reading words. The Moors have also been in dishonor. We have not been enforcing our own state rights of our ancient mothers and fathers. So we must get back to equality and understand we must also enforce the law and be de jure. Back to my point.
Let's read it again. Now that we understand the definition of this word, they know it's what? They're giving a false warranty. That's only good for that snapshot of time until somebody comes back and do what? Listen to me, Morris. You got to catch what they're saying. This is how Morris have to learn how to read. Listen to me, Morris, please. A warranty is what? A promise that a proposition, a fact, is true. But you don't know if it's true until you come back and test the validity of that material fact. So they turn around and tell you what? Well, they already know that it's contemporary new laws they created that's going to undermine that warranty, that it's temporary because they know it's going to expire as soon as more come back and validate the validity of that so-called warranty. And that's erroneous. That they know they gave you a wrong and incorrect warranty. They have no judicial standing in law because the warranty what? The warranty deed Missing the KD. So they know their warranty contemporaneous. It's only good in that snapshot of time until somebody comes back to check the validity of that proposition. You got to see how they talk. That's why I'm taking my time to make sense of this. Their warranty, listen to me, Morris. Their warranty deed is their holy grail to hold on to whatever property they got because the sultans allowed them to have it. But if they're doing things in dishonor, they know they can't keep it because they're violating the treaties. So they keep up this false representation Temporarily, until the Kadi validates their proposition of that material fact to find out that the state of fact is null and void that they call a warranty deed. So the Kadi comes in and validates the fact of their state. And finds out that their state has no facts to support their warranty deed. Sales of personal property. Mother, you can read this again now that we understand what they're saying here. They're saying what? That they're a magi, magician, that they're using wise words, wizard of Oz, wizard. They're using wise words to fool you. Because they know their warranty is not warranted. Read it again, Mom. Sales of personal property. A statement or representation made by the seller of goods contemporaneously with and as a part of the contract of sale. Stop. So they're saying the contract of sale is what? Erroneous. It's wrong. It has defects. It's dishonored. But they're not going to tell you that until you come back and validate it. Continue, Mom. Though collateral to the express object of it, having reference to the character, quality, or title of the goods by which he promises or undertakes that certain facts are or shall be as he then represents them. In that moment of time. He said, yeah, this warranty is good. So you come back to validate. That's when you find out the truth. Okay, let's go down to the word um, contracts. We're going to read now contracts. Okay, more. We're going to take our time. Let's continue, Mo. Contracts. An undertaking or stipulation in writing or verbally that a certain fact in relation to the subject of a contract 
is or shall be as it is stated or promised to be. Case law. Case law. An expression of implied statement of something undertaken as part of contract but collateral to its object. Mm -hmm. A warranty differs from a representation in that a warranty must always be given contemporaneously with. Stop. So that warranty deed must always be given with them knowing through what's called an adhesion contract. What's the adhesion contract? There's a thick contract, all these words, and a thick contract that they don't tell you about. They give you one little piece of paper, sign it, warranty deed. But that warranty deed is really about this thick of liabilities and disclosures they don't tell you about. Because they already know it's erroneous through their statutes. Because they know the Kadi didn't sign it. They know exactly who the Kadi is and they understand its function. Why is the last letter an exclamation point? Uh, in my Black Law Dictionary PDF, it converts words funny sometimes. Oh. Yeah, so it's C A D I. Okay. Yeah. It's correct, it's spelled correctly in the first edition. Yeah. I thought maybe it meant something. No. They were trying to hide from us. Okay, Mother, can we start from the top? Read this sentence again, please. A warranty differs from a representation in that a warranty must always be given contemporaneously with and as part of the contract whereas a representation precedes and induces to the contract. And while that is their difference in nature, their difference in consequence or effect is this, that upon breach of warranty or false warranty, the contract remains binding and damages only are recoverable for the breach. Whereas upon a false representation, the defrauded party may elect to avoid the contract and recover the entire price paid. Okay, stop right there. Listen to me, more. The colonist is what you call a confession. They know that warranty deeds are erroneous. They know that warranty deeds are in dishonor and have a defect. And they're now telling you, you got two options, Moors. You can come back and say, that warranty deed was a fraud. Or you say it was a false representation. Look how they break it down. A warranty differs from a representation in that a warranty must always be given contemporaneously, erroneous, with and as part of the contract. Whereas a representation pre precedes and induces to the contract. And while that is their difference in nature, their difference in consequence, the difference in consequence, the difference in consequence of effect is this. Now they're going to break it down, right? Tell you how the consequences are. That upon breach of warranty or false warranty, now they're telling you, now we're talking about false warranty, that the contract remains binding. And damages only are recoverable for the breach, let's stop right there, because that should be a period, because they get ready to go to the second definition. So what happens? If they provided a false warranty, what's false mean? Fake. The warranty deed not signed by the Kadi is a false representation. So when the Kadi goes to look at the warranty deed, he finds out it's a false representation that it got transferred to the next foreigner without his seal. It becomes a false representation. So what happens? The contract remains binding. And damages only are recoverable for the breach. So what's the damages? Fines, 
penalties, or confiscations. What's the warranty? The treaty. What's the warranty? Their constitution for the United States of America. And anything they've been doing based upon a false representation was the consequence. Fines, penalties, confiscation. Because that warranty is still binding. If Sears goes out of business and gives you a one-year warranty and they go out of business 30 days later, you got a warranty that says it's good for a year. You got 11 months of warranty left on it. How do you enforce it? You got to bring a suit. Because the warranty is still binding because they gave you a false warranty knowing they were in bankruptcy. So how could they give you a guarantee when they themselves are liquidating and dissolving their company slowly but surely? So the United States of America, not to be confused, the United States is giving out warranty deeds knowing the KD is going to come back and validate that warranty and find out it is a false representation. So how do you deal with the consequences? You sue. Fines, penalties, confiscation, cost of court, sanctions. Then the KD puts a lien on the warranty deed because we're looking at the consequences of a false representation. They ain't talking about the jab no more. Now you got them backpedaling because now they want to protect their house. Come to find out their deed is null and void. They don't own a house, even though they never did in the first place. But let's keep it germane and simple. Their warranty becomes null and void because it was a false representation. This is the colonists, this is confession. They're telling you the instructions on how to deal with them. They're also saying to other colonists, here's what's going to happen to us. This is what James Traficant of the United States was trying to tell the administrators of the United States that you guys just created a coroner's report. And when these moors wake up, they're going to take everything from us. Because we're in a status of inequality. Okay, what's the second step of the consequence? Whereas, upon a false representation, the, de the defrauded party may elect to avoid the contract and recover the entire price paid. So we don't worry about that. We go after what? False representation. Because they gave a false warranty to their citizens. They ain't talking about the jab no more. This is what you call counterintelligence. What's happening? Taking our time. The Kazi who issues to the Kadi, the Kazi through council court issues to the Kadi, who's the D tax assessor, to go and assess the D. In order to do what? Recover the sanctions that the foreigner didn't pay. So the consequence is to go after the warranty deed in order to sell the property to pay the fines of the sanctions. But in the status of the Kadi, the Kadi, the Kadi, while the Kadi is doing what? Listen, the Kazi and Kadi create serendipitous discovered checks. What happened? On the discovery, they were checking, the Kadi was checking the validity of the Warranty D. And then what? Discovered. Discovered check. Discovered. Was strategically used in combination of each other. They discover that the warranty D has no seal of a KD. But we already knew that. That's why it's called a discovered check, because we knew we was going to make these moves in the first place. We were playing fifth dimensional chess with them. We knew they were going to ignore 
the state of fact judicial notice. We knew they were going to ignore the injunctive relief. Now we send a contempt of court. We know they're going to ignore that too. Then we send in the CAD because the CAD has now official documents, applications, orders from the CAD to now put a lien and on that warranty deed in order now to recover the fines, the sanctions on behalf of the sanctions that's owed back to cost the court. However, becomes serendipitous. Why? The Kazi's contempt sanction will cause the Kazi to satisfy the validity of the title deed in conformity to the Mohammedan law. But by using this combination, we can create serendipitous discovered checks. We found out that serendipitous means what? You end up getting a two for one. A two for one. You're going to get the court sanctions fees. And we're going to find out that warranty deed is null and void. Now you get the property too. Then we transfer it into a lodeo title. Morris got to catch what's happening now. Okay, let's finish up reading warranty. As we start to wrap up, we'll keep studying warranty. We'll study D. We'll study a lot of words. That way, when we start to now go back and read the warranty D document itself, it'll make sense. We'll start learning how to use the KD and the KD in combination, but the KD must know what the hell he's talking about. That's why we're going through this. Because both the KD and the KD work side by side to enforce Mother's Law, Mother's Law of the land through our Constitution. Let's continue to read. Let's start from the top. A warranty differs from a representation in that a warranty must always be given contemporaneously with and as part of the contract, whereas a representation precedes and induces to the contract. Stop, okay? Okay, let's start there. The same. The same transaction cannot be characterized as a warranty and a fraud at the same time. A warranty rests upon contract, while fraud or fraudulent representations have no element of contract in them, but are essentially a tort. Stop. So what's a tort? A tort is a suit, a lawsuit, under what's called strict liability. Strict Liability. Strict liability. Morris have to study strict liability. We won't go into that right now. That's later on. A tort claim is based upon strict liability, or you can look at what's called negligence liability. But we're talking specifically about strict liability. That's the tort. Why? Because that warranty is a contract. Mm -hmm. So we enforce the strict liability of the contract. Well, what's the contract? The contract is the Constitution's treaties that then set up deeds. And if that deed is not in accordance to or pursuance thereof of both Constitution and treaties, then that means that the contract of the warranty deed is null and void because it's a breach of contract. But it can still be enforced because it's still a warranty contract. I'm talking about the warranty deed should still be enforced for them to have to pay taxes because they do have the warranty deed, but it's a false representation. We either take the property and put it in lodeo title or we allow them to keep it. They got to keep paying taxes. We'll talk about that. Strict liability is what we'll talk about in the future, okay? Let's continue, Mo. When judges or law writers speak of a fraudulent warranty, the language is neither accurate nor perspicuous. Perspicuous. If there is a breach of warranty, it cannot be said that the warranty was fraudulent with any more propriety than any other contract, contract can be said to have been fraudulent. 
because there had been a breach of it. On the other hand, to speak of a false representation as a contract or warranty, or as tending to prove a contract or warranty, is a perversion of language and of correct ideas. Okay, so what are they saying here? Don't try to enforce fraud, enforce false representation. Because false representation puts you in a position now where you can have to go after fines, penalties, confiscations, which is the consequences of false representation of a warranty. Warranty deed is a false representation that's going to end up with consequences. Okay, let's read general warranty. We'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up from there. General warranty, the name of a covenant of warranty inserted in deeds by which the grantor binds himself, his heirs, etc., to warrant and forever defend to the grantee his heirs, etc. The title thereby conveyed against the lawful claims of all persons whatsoever. Where the warranty is only against the claims of persons claiming by, through, or under the grantor or his heirs, it is called a specialty warranty. Okay, so there's two parts here. The last sentence is about special warranty. The first part is about general warranty. We're going to learn that the colonists check a box called general warranty when they give you a warranty deed. There's an overwhelming probability that most warranty deeds are based on what's called general warranty. But what does general warranty mean? General warranty, the name of a covenant of warranty inserted in deed by which the grantor binds himself his heirs, etc., to warrant and forever defend to the grantee, his heirs, etc., that the title thereby conveyed against the lawful claim of all persons whatsoever. So when a warranty deed was transferred as a general warranty, they say that general warranty gave an insurance policy an insurance policy, an insurance policy against what? All persons whatsoever who are making lawful claims. What am I saying? Their general warranty is a false representation because they already know, as soon as they put the word, all persons whatsoever means that's any and everybody who's coming back to make a claim on that property. They're saying that insurance policy protects against anybody, all persons trying to make a claim to that property. While simultaneously, the administrators know that a CAD didn't sign off on that warranty deed. So this is a false representation that they're saying about a general warranty that covers claims of all persons whatsoever against that warranty deed. We're going to learn more about this. As I close, here's something Morris must understand. Here's a parable. We're talking about words. The Wizard of Oz was using wise words to control the land of Oz. But the wizard of Oz, who was a magi, using words to intimidate people, to impose his will through coercion and corruption, the wizard of Oz, who's defined in Merriam-Webster's dictionary as chiefly British, so the colonists, i.e. the foreigners, through the movie Wizard of Oz, are talking about themselves being the wizard. They're claiming a false jurisdiction in someone else's land and claiming that they are the land lord. They're using words. Listen, Morris. 
parable. John chapter 1, verse 1, King James Version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. What does this mean? Listen, Moses. In the beginning was the Word. Words created the beginning. Then the Word was with God. Now the Word now is now with God. And the Word was God. Now they became one. Word and God were two. Then over here they became one. What's the most important word here? Word. That's why I have it underlined. Word. Not the word God. People focusing on the word God. They're not focusing on the word word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Listen. She who controls the land controls its laws and its wealth. So who's the she? Talking politics, constitution. This is an anthropomorphic story. We're talking politics, she. Who's the she? Constitution. Constitution controls the land, the jurisdiction. And if you control the land, it means you control the laws. And if you control the laws, you control everything else, including its wealth. So the words of the constitution, listen, Who is God? God is the words. Who is God? The words. Listen. Who controls the words? The state, i.e. God. Because God is now the states. It's going to make sense. Government Ordinance Department, God. Government Ordinance Department of the states controlling the words. Who had the words first? The natural people had the words. What do we do? We put the words into what? The Constitution. Of what? The state. Now the state has the word of the people. It becomes the God. Listen. In the beginning was the word. That's the living being. And the word was with God. Now the word is now with who? The state. And the word was God. So the word and the state come together. And God becomes a state, all power of what? Controlling the laws of words through a political document. So the Moors, in the beginning, we've got our abstract thinking. Those are words. Those are words. Now we must put those words into what? Constitution. Put the words into the Constitution. The God is the, is the state. Those words, along with the state, become God. That's what the Moors are missing. We have our abstracts, moral, ethics, 100% on point. We're missing what? The pen. Put it into a state, provincial government constitution. Allow the state, the power of the state, which becomes the God. Government, ordinance, department is government. State rights. More state rights of our Constitution. When we do that, we will be able to defend our laws and our wealth. I end with that. Islam. Islam. Islam.